go somewhere. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians as we go on a walk through the seven churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe what all of us are going to see tonight is one of the wonders of God's words, and that is that God's word anticipates our needs spiritually, our needs in, in the realm of our daily walk before we even know what our needs are going to be. God's word anticipates and speaks to and meets that. As we'll see in the book of Ephesians, when you see the city in which these people lived, the little letter Paul wrote to them exactly anticipated every need that they were going to have to live out this life of Christ. This evening, we're looking archaeologically at the stones of God's witness. We're going to walk through the sites of the seven letters to Christ's church, specifically tonight, Ephesus. Why do we study these biblical sites? Because God's word reveals God's truth, anticipating our needs, just like tomorrow's news report. You know, if you knew what was going to happen in advance tomorrow, you could prepare. God says, I already know what's going to happen in your tomorrow, and you can prepare spiritually. And that's what we see with these people of Ephesus. Well, let's uh, read together this. Uh, in fact, you guys have not been up and down. Don Locke used to make us go up and down, and we had to do all kinds of stuff. So let's stand up to read this letter, okay? And we'll read it in unison, uh, and just these uh, powerful words of Christ's letter. Together, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's bow together. Father, thank you that your son, our Savior, wrote a letter to this church. And just as much as he wrote it to them nearly 20 centuries ago, you have written to us because we are partakers with them of your spirit. And we also live in a very, very difficult time and place to live as believers and so I pray that we would heed the words of your word tonight and that we would learn how we can live a life of victory and triumph that loves you, that loves your truth, that lives in purity, that resists the evil influences around us wherever they might be, and that causes us to triumph even over strong occultic power as we are seeing increasing in the world around us. So teach us how to live for you in our world as you taught them, so that we, as they, might glorify you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated, and as you're seated, let's go to Ephesus. Those people of Ephesus, if you were living uh, in the ancient Roman world and arrived in Ephesus tonight, there's only one site that would totally capture your attention. It wouldn't be the harbor that would just be thriving with boats bustling in and out. It wouldn't be the roads that would be lined with exotic spices and goods from the east. What would catch your eye would be this gold-covered building, the largest building that was built in the ancient Greco-Roman world. It was that which overshadowed all the inhabitants of the city of Ephesus. They lived in the shadow 
of the largest building of the ancient world. The stones of God's witness in Ephesus teach us how to love Christ supremely in really bad times and in really bad places. Ephesus today, it's on all the maps. You watch the news, you read the newspaper, it's right there next to Turkey, uh, in in Turkey, right next to Iraq, Syria, uh, bordering on that area that is so much a part of the 150,000 American troops which are building up and all those Turkish troops you read about today that are massing on the border with Iraq. This was, though, the first church of of Christ's little epistles, his little letters to the churches of Revelation 2 and 3. As you see right there in that one, it's the only piece of this largest building of the ancient world. It was destroyed by an earthquake, and then it was looted and carried off, and the gold taken off, and so actually every bit of it has been crushed. This column here, as you can see, is just in pieces. It's not even a complete column, but it's all that's left of the incredible building, which towered. 425 feet long, 225 feet wide, filled with a forest of 130, 30,000 pounds, 60 foot high columns with a huge roof suspended over the top of that, the city of Ephesus. Ephesus, as you'll see in the next slide, was famous for its unparalleled beauty. This is the Ephesian theater looking from the west. This theater easily seated in its marble seats over 20,000 people. It was also, in the next slide, famous for its religion. Uh, the religion of Ephesus was the religion of a god that fell down from heaven. And this god was the ugly uh, god of, of Ephesus, Diana of the Ephesians. And this religion was famous. And as I said last time, coins from all the known world were found along this street as they excavated and lifted the paving stones. Thirdly, on the next slide, it was famous for its place among the cities. It was first among all the ancient Greco-Roman cities. It only was exceeded by the city of Rome for its wealth, for its power, uh, for the sheer influence that Ephesus had in the ancient world. But within Ephesus, there was a powerful founding by God. Acts 19, 11 through 19, as we saw last time, records the supernatural founding of the church. And in this place, the theater which still stands, the agora in front of it, God marvelously turned people from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. They received forgiveness of sins and a heavenly inheritance as they receive the faith that's in Christ. You remember at their powerful founding, they burned their books, which totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. A piece of silver was a great amount of money. And to have a lifetime of savings of these books that they burned because they wanted nothing to do with the occult. Ephesus also, in the next slide we see, had godly nurturing. Uh, it was host, as we saw last time also, for the, the, the tutelage and discipleship of the greatest. The Apostle Paul ministered heavily, most of all in Ephesus and anywhere else. The Apostle John ministered exceedingly there, multiple times coming and going. He was exiled just off the coast in Patmos. He was there to the end of his life. That's where Mary uh, spent the last days of her life under John's care and many, many others. Timothy, as 1 Timothy 3, or 1, 3 reminds us, was the pastor of this massive church, godly nurturing. Next slide reminds us that means that Ephesus had a tremendous heritage. Ephesus was so deeply influenced by the word of God and by the servants of God that the Lord Jesus Christ had high expectations of them. Let's learn what they were taught and how they, in, in this wonderful little letter we read together just a few moments ago, had nothing negative said about them except that they had lowered the intensity and the, the absolute completeness of their love toward Jesus Christ. But they were not in those sins that they had been saved from. They had just lessened from that first love status. What a lesson for us to learn how to live in bad times and bad places. They lived in the shadow of the largest building of the ancient world, which teaches us you can live for Christ in any culture, at any time, in any setting. It doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter whether you live on the wrong side or the right side of the tracks. It doesn't matter if you live with an unsafe family or a safe family. It doesn't matter if you work in a place with a bunch of pagans or you work in a Christian environment. You can live for Christ on a daily basis as they did in the shadow of the greatest evil influence, of the greatest and strongest immorality, of the greatest satanic influence and occultic power, and even in rampant materialism, because those were the characteristics of this world that they lived in. Well, what did the believers face every day in Ephesus? Let's look at what they faced. And then from the book of Ephesians, I want you to note in your Bibles specifically how the Apostle Paul taught them that they could live in such a way that pleased Christ even in that environment they lived in. First of all, they lived in the presence of strong immorality. I've told you before that this temple was actually a temple to wickedness, a temple to immorality, a temple to licentiousness, a temple to every type of base desire, every craving of the flesh was embodied by this temple. It had male and female priests and priestesses who gave their bodies in sexual offering to anybody who would come to worship the god Diana. They would offer themselves free of charge in any form of filth. In fact, the ancient world is noted for the graphic nature even of the paving stones. And if you go through some of these ancient cities, most of the guides won't point it out, but you can see these little figures that are actually chiseled into the stone. And if you were a person who wanted normal immorality, you'd follow one kind of marking in the stones. If you wanted uh, some aberrant bestiality, you'd follow another one, or homosexuality, or lesbianism. You would just follow these different markings in the road. And all of them would lead to little special places where you could worship the gods in that horrible fleshly way. They lived in the presence of strong immorality, which I must say we do too. But you can stay pure for Christ in any culture even one where the paving stones, every time you walk in them, remind you of your old life if you're saved, or tempt you towards something you've never experienced, or draw you back. It, it doesn't matter which side of the, the road you're on. Those streets reminded them of the strong immorality. And you know what the scriptures say? You can stay pure for Christ in any culture, at any time young or old, at the end of your life, or just starting to understand all that, and in any setting. How did they do it? Well, the next slide answers that. By the way, this is that great goddess that they worship, this fertility symbol, this symbol of immorality and decadence and paganism and unbridled lust. But how did they overcome immorality? Well, let's look and back up one, back up to two, three. Or is that, there we go. Uh, look at, at uh, Ephesians 2.3. This is the first one we're going to, to uh, mark in our Bibles. How did they overcome immorality? First of all, they were repenting of their past. Look what it says in chapter 2 and verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What Paul tells him is you have to be constantly reminded that, that when Christ calls you, you are repenting of your past. Lust, the cravings of the body uh, that is chasing after pleasures, and, and uh, the lustings of the eyes chasing after stuff, and the boastings of the mouth chasing after status, all of those have to be repented of. The body has to be desired to be repented of chasing after pleasures uh, that are ungodly and that are unbiblical, and so the mind and the pride of life. These things, they constantly reminded, as Paul said, that those were in times past. You lived according to the lust of your flesh, verse 3 says. You were fulfilling those desires of the flesh and of your mind. Now, it's interesting what Paul says in, in the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, he asks this. He says, purge yourself of all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. He says, you have to, you have to uh, like the firemen do, when they put out forest fires, they not only put out the forest fire, if you notice, they stay around and they keep digging up and raking and, and, and stirring it up because they don't want to leave the coals to reignite. And that's where not only do we repent of the fleshly things, but of the mind, as the Puritans used to say, the body never goes anywhere where the... the I mean, the wagons follow the ruts. And so our mind always puts ruts that our body will follow. And so what we have to learn to do is to purge ourselves, repenting of the lust that we have, especially, verse 3 says, 
and of the mind. We have to have pure minds, minds that are clean. Uh, as it says in, in Hebrews 9, 15 and, and 14, where it talks about through the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit purges our conscience from works that lead us to death. And Hebrews 10, 22 says, then we can draw near to God in full assurance of faith, having our bodies washed from an evil all the evil, and our, our minds sprinkled from an evil conscience. God wants us to be cleansed and pure, repenting of our past. Secondly, how did they overcome immorality? They were seeing their calling. Look at verse 10. Paul reminds them. It's anticipating what they were going to struggle with. He says this, For we are his workmanship. You are not made for lust. You are not made for immorality. You are not made for, for yielding to the, to the burnings of your flesh. You were made, rather, to yield, as verse 10 says, you are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Who defines that? God does. We don't. We say, you're, you created me for your purposes. I want to yield to do what is good in your sight. You see, we live in a relativistic uh, society that, that has no absolutes and, and that says, well, to you that may be bad, to me it's not. God says, I'm the authority. I'm the source. I'm the one that created you. Verse 10 says, you need to see your calling. Your calling is that you were created for good works. God prepared beforehand that that's the way you should walk if you're born again. So how did they overcome the immorality as they were walking down the street? Well, they were repenting. They were constantly saying no to sin. And if they even took a step in the wrong direction, they would say no. And they would claim that Jesus Christ had set them free and they would go back. And then as they were going back to Christ, they were remembering their calling. Third area. They not only were seeing their calling, they were learning the secret. Look at verse 22 of chapter 4. Because, again, how did they overcome immorality? They were learning the secret. What is the secret? The secret is this. Put off concerning your former conduct. You have to systematically put off those old things. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Those, those hungerings of the flesh and those, those desires of the eyes and those, those elements of pride, the boastings of the pride of life that's chasing after status and eyes that chase after stuff and a body that chases after pleasure has to be put off. Did you know we have to deny? We have to say no. Uh, that's why it's so important to memorize verses. I enjoyed uh, uh, Christian Shannon's uh, testimony tonight because those verses, did you hear them just coming out? Those are so vital. Thy word have I hid in my heart. What? That I might not sin against thee. And so what they did is they learned the secret of putting off, verse 22, and of being renewed in the spirit of your mind and of putting on. They learned this secret. They learned to say no to sin. They learned that, that at that moment that God has said, there is no temptation we'll ever confront face to face except what is common to us. But God will, with that temptation, always make an escape route. You know, when we drive back and forth across the country, whenever there's uh, up and down hills, especially long grades, along the road, you'll find those, those runaway truck routes. Those are escape routes for if you lose your brakes. You can just go into that sand, and it will stop you without crashing. The Lord says every time you're on a hill and you're building up speed and that temptation is, is starting to get so you're going to crash into it, he said, there's an escape route. I've always made a way for you to escape. So they learned the secret of putting off. How else did they overcome immorality? They renounced their old ways. Look at chapter 5 and verse 12. They had to learn to renounce, to declare that that, that, that was no longer a part of their life. This is what it says in Ephesians 5 and verse 12. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. You and I in our lives should seek with all of our heart to let Christ deeply penetrate our lives and we renounce all touch with the old ways. We should not easily be able to talk about sin. You know, I'm astounded at how young people can just, they can just talk about sin. You know what the scriptures say? It's shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. What, what things are these? Well, uh, talking, if you back up, look at verse 3 of chapter 5. Fornication. Fornication is any type of sexual activity outside the sanctity of marriage. Any type. And that's not only you participating in it, it's you looking at it. Now, wait a minute. Verse 12 says, 
it is shameful to even speak. If it's shameful to speak, it's equally shameful to look. That's why this whole concept of looking at, at the, the television shows, that, that almost all of them are about affairs, is, is how they call adultery and fornication. They're about uh, doing things that are, are unholy and unpleasing to the Lord and are fornications. And so the, he says in verse 3, don't have anything to do, Ephesians 5, 3, with fornication and uncleanness. That's filthiness, talking about, I mean, just the base discussion of of things that, that God says are shameful to talk about, uncleanness, anything to do with all the, the base and prurient and, and wickedness of this world. He says, don't have anything to do with it. Or covetousness. I mean, if, if you watch the um, shows that elicit coveting desires, you know what coveting means? I want something I don't have. We say, oh, it's my goal. No, it can be an idol. It can, be, it can be driving us to, toward materialism. So he says, don't have anything to do, verse 3, with covetousness. Let it not be named among you. Verse 4, neither filthiness. There's some people that, that any humor always goes south. It always gets into filthy talk, innuendo, uh, some type of immoral or sexual um, twist to it, especially those night shows. Their humor is always... Uh, What's neat is to meet someone that, that has a level of purity in their life that they don't understand what they're talking about. You know, that, that shows up often in children. They'll, they'll hear something and they say, what was funny about that? You say, praise the Lord. It's not funny, but you've never learned the shameful things that, that the world laughs at. He says, don't, don't allow filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting. You ever meet people that are always just, I'm just jesting. He says, don't jest. Those are not convenient, but rather what you should do is let your mouth be giving thanks. For you know that no whoremonger, that's a person who can't control their sexual desires, nor unclean person, that's someone who can't control their mind, it's always in the gutter, nor covetous man, that's someone who can't control their desire for stuff, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He says, renounce all touch with your own ways. Verse 12, it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done. And you know what? Those people began walking through Ephesus in newness of life. They said, I have repented of that. I know I was created for his glory. And I'm going to renounce my old ways. I'm not even going to talk when I walk down that street by all those symbols of my former life. I'm not going to talk about what they do in that temple. I'm not going to go and watch a movie of what they do in that temple. I'm not going to sit around and listen to jokes about what they do in that temple of immorality. See why they had such wonderful, holy, pure lives? They renounced. They, they learned the secret of 4, 22, 23, 24. They put off, they were renewed, and they put on the new man. And they realized the Christian life is just a series and a succession of new beginnings. They were walking. They would be walking along, and all of a sudden their foot would stop, and they'd look down, and they'd see that little sign, and they'd think about what they used to do. And all of a sudden, these desires would start rising in their hearts, and they would look toward that temple, and they would look at the people coming and going and everything that's going on, and all of a sudden they would start feeling that tug. And at that moment, they would say, no, I was created for his glory. I'm not going to go that way. I renounce my old ways. I repent of that. I put off that desire. I want to be, verse 23 of chapter 4, renewed in the spirit of my mind. I want to not grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be turning that faucet of, of the fullness of the Spirit off. And I want newness of life. And so they learn that they must, as chapter 5, verse 12 says, renounce all touch with their old ways. Well, secondly, they lived not only by the strong immorality, but this temple also spoke of very strong evil influences. Let me talk to you about this temple. Not only in the confines of this glittering structure would be thousands of male and female prostitutes giving themselves to sordid worship to all the pantheon of fertility deities, and not only would these wicked people at dusk go to the city to earn a living, in the bustling atmosphere of travelers, both from land and sea. But this temple, uh, because it was dedicated to, to this patron goddess, Diana, was revered by law-abiding and criminal types alike. Even criminals were afraid of Diana. They didn't want 
to, to have her wrath. And so what happened was this temple, being the most revered site in the ancient world to literally millions of worshipers, a custom had arisen that anyone was free of any uh, jurisdiction of anyone as long as they stayed within a 200-yard security zone. In other words, if you could be within 600 feet of this, you couldn't be prosecuted. It was kind of like the cities of refuge in the Old Testament time. And so this became a haven. Criminals would come from far and wide to stay within the shadow of this structure. And their presence only permeated the city with evil. And so Ephesus not only had this sordid, immoral worship going on inside that place, but all the way around it, the Roman government couldn't arrest. They were kind of like under the patronage of Diana. And so they couldn't arrest these, these low baser types that were in evil influence. And so if you can imagine the carnival atmosphere that arose with thousands of prostitutes coming and going and these criminals just hanging around, and there was just a permeation of Ephesus with evil. Well, you can stay true to Christ in any culture uh, if you get shipped off in the military, go off to college, get a new job, live in a new part of town, start out on your own, any culture, at any time, in any setting, how did they do that? Well, let's go back to the book of Ephesians and learn that. The first one's in chapter 4. How did they overcome evil influences? Look at verse 25. This is how these people overcame the evil influences. I mean, can you imagine uh, your job you had to run by? By the way, this temple also became the place where you... They had vaults for safekeeping inside. They had uh, a lot of legal proceedings. I mean, uh, what a place if, if you were not a particularly moral, what a place to set up shop. I mean, it was kind of like endless. It's kind of like one of those uh, places uh, where you can get as many refills as you want. You know, the drinks, you buy one cup. That's how they felt about their sin. They could get as many refills as they want in that place. But if you lived in that town, you had to go by that temple. How did you resist those evil influences? Well, chapter 4, verse 25 gives us the first one. They had learned that they were to be committed to the truth. Wherefore, putting away lying, because everybody around that temple spoke of, of untruthfulness and of, of those who were not willing to, to yield and go God's way. And speak every man the truth of his neighbor, for we are members of one another. They were committed to the truth. They had learned that they had to speak the truth and they had to say it right out and they could not at all um, waver on their, their commitment to the truth. They couldn't say, oh, well, I'm not sure if I can, um, 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 um. They say, no, no, I bought with a price. I have to glorify God with my body. I cannot be involved with that evil. By the way, at the end of that road right there, that two-story two structure you see was one of the greatest libraries in the ancient world. That's the library of Celsus. And there were more volumes of more paganism, occult, witchcraft, and falsehood of all the pantheon of the Greco-Roman world gods, all of Olympus's cast, right at the end of that road that those people had to walk down every day. And as they walked down that road, as they went by that temple, as they went through that library and went through their lives, they said, we are committed to the truth. Because the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They were committed to the truth. Secondly, Second truth, they learned to flee evil. And this is a very practical. Look at verse 26 of Ephesians 4. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but let him labor, working with his hands, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Only what's good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to hearers. Verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, by which you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Another fascinating thing about Ephesus is the river that fed the great harbor where all the boats were, uh, that river also was the center of some amazing logging. Inland in Asia Minor, they had the rich uh, hardwood trees that grew in those uh, mountainous areas, and they would be sawn and cut and dragged down and floated down. But the way you would identify whose log was who is, they would scrape out a hollow, and down in the hollow they would put wax, and they would put signet rings down into a cleft in the log, and they would let that log bump and go down the river, and when it got to the end, they would take them and sort them out, and they would look in to those little uh, recessed pockets and find the stamp of the signet. That was, they were sealed. They were given an identifying mark, and so you didn't have to worry about your log getting lost because at the end of the river, when they were all captured just before they went out into the ocean and dragged on shore, 
the owner would be found for each one. And using that metaphor, he uses the actual same word as he says to them in verse 30, you are sealed to the day of redemption. He says, you might feel like you're bumping through Ephesus every day with all the other logs and all these sinners and pagans and this big towering edifice of evil. But he said, don't grieve the one that sealed you for the day of redemption. So you have to learn a secret. And that secret is they fled from evil. They saw that they were starting to go back toward the signs on the road, or they saw themselves being drawn toward uh, perhaps some evil philosophy or some uh, lower baser type that was operating maybe a little uh, shading the truth and fudging the numbers as they went by that 600-foot perimeter of, of criminals. And they said, no, no, I'm going to flee evil, and I don't want to grieve the spirit. Here's another way that they had to face the truth. They lived in the presence of strong materialism. Uh, I can't say enough how strong the allure of, of money was to them. The nearly universal of worship of Diana caused no one to be daring to rob her. Thus, behind the altars of this temple, you see, was the World Bank. It was a place where currency and treasures were kept. And so, much like New York City and Los Angeles and any other thriving metropolis is in our day, there was this strong wealth syndrome and a status and materialism. And so they lived in the presence of strong materialism, not only the gold gleaming from this temple, but the people that, that were affluent and showed off their wealth and caused others to want that. And so what the lesson we learned from the book of Ephesians is you can love Christ in any culture, any time, in any setting. Remember Jesus said because of the Increase good, the loves of, love of many will grow cold. Did you know materialism takes away the love of God's people? When, when you start loving things, you can't love Christ. He says, he says, you have to choose which you want. No one can serve two masters. Either you serve the dollar, either you serve the job, the power, the status, the stuff, or you serve Christ. You, you can't have both, he says. And so these people were constantly being tempted to go to the materialism. And what the book of Ephesians tells us is you can love Christ. You can say no to materialistic desires in any culture, in any time, in any setting. Let's see how they did it. How did they overcome the strong materialism? By the way, this is the great Agora area. The first thing they did, and let's go to chapter 1 and verse 11. How did they overcome strong materialism? They knew what they had inherited in Ephesians 1.11. It says in Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we've obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purposes of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Did you see the magazine last week? Uh, Christina Onassis, or whatever her name is. I forgot her name. It's the young Onassis, the, the granddaughter. She just inherited. One magazine said $800 million, The other one said $1.6 It doesn't matter. It's a lot. She's a young lady. Or a woman. I don't think she's a lady. She's a woman. Uh, she doesn't have lady likeness to her. She's living in sin. But that she knows what she's inherited. Do you think she'd be interested in, in, in someone offering her, you know, a few thousand or a few million for something? No, no, she knows what she has. And see, what kept them from the, the allure of materialism, they knew that they'd already inherited everything. Look at that verse and think about what it's saying to us. We have obtained an inheritance. We have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. And Peter adds to it, we have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled. It, it cannot go to ruins like this marketplace did. It cannot be robbed. It cannot be taken away like how many trillions of dollars have gone away from the equities market in the last couple of years? It can't evaporate. It can't be taken away. We can't lose it. We, we can't have our company go bankrupt. We have a secure inheritance, and it won't wear out like our bodies will, and our health, and our minds. And so they knew what they'd inherited. That was the first level. It doesn't stop there. Second verse that Paul wrote them is in verse 14. They knew that what they'd inherited was secure. It says in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. I like what Chris said in his testimony about how he knew he had security. Well, all, all Chris and we have gotten is just the down payment. I don't know about you, but, but you can put a deposit, a very small deposit on something and hold it. But that small deposit pales compared to what it is that you're buying, be it a house. Uh, be it a, a car, be it a, some, some business, you put a down payment on it, the down payment is nothing compared to what you have. In fact, this word that's used in verse 14, arabon, it, it's 
it's also used for an engagement ring. I'll tell you what, I remember giving Bonnie her engagement ring. I tell you, that ring is nothing compared to Bonnie. I mean, throw the ring away, I want her, right? That is, is what he's saying. He said these people realize that they knew that they were secure because they got the, the Holy Spirit, but he's just the down payment, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. They knew that they were secure. Verse 18, third thing that kept them from this materialism is in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so you know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. They had their eyes opened. They saw that apart from God's blessing, all that we have is just dust. Apart from the breath of God, all that we are is dust. Apart from God's grace and blessing, all that we have is, is something that's crumbling. I mean, if, if you don't keep taking care of stuff, it's just going back to, to chaos. And they saw their eyes were open to what really matters in life. And it helped them not have such a strong, alluring desire for materialism. Look at verse 7 of chapter 2. They also knew that they had more than can be counted. It says in Ephesians 2, 7, Paul taught these Ephesians that were living in, in the shadow of strong materialism, that in the ages to come, he, Christ, might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, God the Father, through Christ, is going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace throughout all ages. I mean, they said, you mean if I give up this temporary chasing of stuff right now, which I can't keep and I can't take it with me, and the more I get, the less I'll like it, and the less I'll be satisfied, and the more I want. You mean if I, if I pass that off and instead turn my eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth grow strangely dim? Wow. And they, they thought about that, and they made the choice. And as it says in verse 7, they realized that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. That's why... The book of Revelation is so wonderful, it shows us the ending. It shows us finally a home at last. Finally, in the place where true riches are, with the one that loved us and gave himself for us, and that love constrains us to give ourselves back. One last verse. They knew that they had more than they could dream of. Look at Ephesians 3, 8. This is what Paul says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among you, Ephesian Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, I was reading all this space shuttle stuff. I mean, every day goes by, something else comes out. And it talked about how the Israeli astronaut was so, you know, overwhelmed as he looked down at Jerusalem from the space shuttle and saw the sun. And, you know, it just was overwhelming to him. And that uh, commander husband, you know, had the, the effective witness talking to him. In fact, uh, you know, it said that they all knew for 60 seconds they were going to die. Isn't that neat to think about? They had a whole minute to think about it. They all knew for 60 seconds they were going to die. I bet Commander Husband was evangelizing like mad. Can you imagine him saying, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and looked at them and knew the ones that weren't saved. I mean, can you imagine? But just think, up there before the crash, especially... Uh, the Israeli colonel was so overwhelmed at the beauty of the universe. And you know what you and I have? It says in verse 8, we have the unsearchable riches of Christ. I mean, people are dying for stuff on this earth. This earth is just a speck in the universe. And the God who made it all, who's going to destroy all this and make new stuff with no sin and thorns and spiders and bugs and snakes, he's going to make it perfect. He's going to give it all to us, and we inherit it in Christ. That's the answer. They knew they had more than they could dream of. Okay, let's get the last one. They also, next slide, they lived in the presence of strong Satanism. The occult was strong. And what we have to learn is we can triumph through Christ in any culture, at any time, in any setting. And let's begin that tonight, because this is so important. Next slide shows us the first thing that they learn. Jesus is above all others. In Ephesians 1, 20 and 22, how did they overcome the strong influence of Satanism? And by the way, the scriptures tell us that, that we are in spiritual warfare. 
And spiritual warfare, to most Christians, is a defensive mode. Most people act like they're prisoners of war instead of being more than conquerors. We need to see that the gates of hell cannot withstand our onslaught. Instead of us backing up and trying to resist all the satanic stuff coming toward us, we are supposed to be marching forward and finding that Satan cannot withstand our penetration into the darkness of the world around us. We should be on the offense. Our weaponry is offensive. Uh, it, it is for us to go out and to penetrate, the, as Paul did in this city. But what does he say in Ephesians 1, 20 and 22? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, and might, dominion, and every name that is named. In other words, there is no realm of the fallen world of Satan that can withstand the gospel, not only in this world, but in the world to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things the church. And that's why it says in Matthew 16 and verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the onslaught of the church. You know what most of us are doing? We're acting like we're in a prison camp. We don't even get outside the church. We're stuck in here. You know what? If you leave this place in the power of Christ and resist the strong Satanism around us that's blinding the minds, the, the evolutionary thought that so blinds the education system and all the, the, the godless philosophy of the higher education system. If we go out, we can penetrate that with the power of the gospel if we realize that Jesus is above all and we are more than conquerors through him. We'll start on this street in that verse next time, okay? But it's time for us to have pancakes, okay? So... Let's take a moment to ask the Lord to firmly plant this in our minds, and then we'll go and have our fellowship meal together. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you that we get to read in this book about a group of people that loved you right where they were in that strong, immorally sordid place in that place with pervasive evil influences, with bad company that corrupts good manners, in a place where the overpowering influence of materialism was rampant, in a place where the occult just bubbled up on every hand and where Satanism and satanic occultic power of magic and witchcraft just faced those people everywhere they walked, everywhere they worked, everywhere they lived, they couldn't escape it. And how wonderful to know that they could love you, they could live for you, they could keep true to you and keep pure and not grow cold and distant, even in that culture, even in that setting, even living in the shadow of that building, a monument to sin, Lord, I pray that wherever your servants are tonight, that they would realize that they can overcome strong immorality, that they can resist the siren calls of materialism, that they can say no to those evil influences and people that try and conform them to the world, but rather they can say no and be conformed to you, O Christ, and that the deadening coldness of the occult can be resisted if we learn to renounce those things, if we learn to stay away from them and not go back, that we learn to not even speak, let alone look at those things which are done in secret. I pray that tonight that, that there would be a desire in the hearts of your servant to not look at evil. I think of just about every form of media that's coming out today grieves your spirit. And so many Christians wonder why they're cold and can't get anything out of the Bible. It's because you keep getting quenched and grieved in their hearts as they subject you to evil. I pray there'd be some choices made tonight to not go back to evil, but rather to renounce, to repent, and to flee that, and rather to pursue righteousness and love and godliness. Thank you for this night. I pray that as we look at Ephesus, we will grow in your grace through your word. Thank you for our supper, the fellowship supper we're going to celebrate together. Pray you'd bless our time around the tables with thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go.